Bad Boys. Welcome everyone to HTF Bets. My name is Robert Husby. I'm joined along with my co-host for today, Mr. Nick Geddes. Nick, how you doing? I'm doing good. There's a lot of sports going on. MLB playoffs have kicked off, so it's madness right now with games going on during the day, and I'm very excited to talk about it. Yep, absolutely. And joining us for his first appearance on HTF Bets, Jason Hamby. Jason, how you doing today, man? Awesome, man. Awesome. So, yeah, we're, we're doing MLB postseason today. Um, we got some of the games going on right now. Astros series is going on. I think they're up one nothing, up one nothing in the series. That series could end today. There's a couple series that could, could end today. But, Jason, I'm going to go to you first. Is there a series you're watching in particular, um, you know, to, to either end today or, you know, maybe go to a game three? Is there any, you know, maybe series that hasn't kicked off that, that you're excited for? Yeah, a couple of them. Uh, in particular, I, I like the Yankees a lot tonight. Um, Masahiro Tanaka is on the mound for the Yanks. He has a one uh, uh, sub 1.5 ERA in the postseason. Really just turns it on in October. Uh, knows how to pitch. Um, and uh, they're facing the Indians with Carrasco. Uh, I really like that matchup. Um, personally, I had the White Sox to win their series um, on my betting-wise. I think they were um, plus, plus favorites at like 120. Uh, so I had them before yesterday's game, and that's looking good. I think Keiko will get it done today, and they'll sweep the A's. Yeah, I think that's a safe bet. Yeah, the the Yankees, you brought them up. I mean, good Lord, they put up 12 runs on the road. I mean, that's just insane. Luke Voigt was asked before before the series started, like, the Yankees don't hit away from home. Like, is that a problem? He's like, no, that's, that's not true. So it clearly yeah. wasn't true because they lit up Shane Bieber and the Indians yesterday. Um, Nick, is there a series you're watching, you know, if you want to expand on the Yankees series, if there's anything you're looking at in particular, obviously you're a Rays guy. They, they, Blake Snell dealt last night. They look good. Yeah, they look like, they look like the number one seed and they did it with the normal things that we've seen the Rays do their entire time that they've been a really good team, pitching and defense. A lot of plays, there are a lot of hits that the Blue Jays had that could have gotten through. Willie Adamas played exceptional defense and they went to the bullpen early, even with Blake Snell uh, pitching a no hitter. He gave up the first hit. And Kevin Cash, as usual, pulled him out, and he played the matchup game. And the first guy you saw was Diego Castillo. Then you saw Nick Anderson. So he's not afraid to bring in the high-leverage relievers early in the biggest situations to win the game. And I think that's what sets him apart as, a, as one of the best managers in baseball. I'll touch on the Brewers and Dodgers just quickly. I think the Brewers are in trouble. Um, they limped into the playoffs, kind of. And game one, the bullpen is going to be tested right away because Brent Suter's starting. So that tells me they're going to use that bullpen a lot. And, you know, their best two bullpen pieces are Devin Williams and Josh Hader. And I don't think you're going to see those guys until late in the game if it's close. So I don't know if we're going to get to those guys. And I think the Dodgers have a chance to jump up early. And we're going to see if Walker Bueller can have a really good start because he did not have a good season this year. Uh, he was very inconsistent. But the Dodgers trusted him to get him that, that game one start over Kershaw. So we're going to see what happens with that one. Yeah, and Devin obviously. Williams is also out. Devin Williams is out for the wild card series, left off the roster. Yeah, there you go. Right there. That's a big, that's another big loss for the Brewers right there. So, yeah, I think the Brewers are in trouble, and I think this one's going to end with two games. Yeah, I, I mean, I hope so personally. But, you know, yeah, definitely. I mean, definitely a different Brewers team from last season even. I mean, last season the Brewers were world beaters, and they looked great. And this season not so much. I mean, that's kind of been the case with the, the short season. Even the Yankees look terrible for most of the season with injuries. Um, yeah, but it's, it's definitely, you know, I think with Walker Bueller starting, it shows the confidence they have in him to get it done. He is the future ace of that team. Kershaw, you know, is getting up there in age. He obviously had a much better season though. So it'll be interesting to see. Uh, it is a one, two punch. So hopefully the Dodgers can close that series out pretty quickly. Um, but let's, let's talk about, I'm going to go to you, Nick, first on this one. Let, let's talk about the Minnesota twins. The Minnesota twins haven't won a playoff series all right, well, playoff game in 17 games. How bad of a record is that for the Minnesota Twins? I mean, how, how do they get out of this? They need to win, right? I mean, they need to get a win. Yeah, but yeah, when I saw that, when I saw that stat pop up yesterday when they lost to Houston, I, I, it's unbelievable almost that they've really, because I feel like they've been in the playoffs so many times and, you know, you feel like they had squeaked at least one win out this entire time, but not the case. And yesterday, you know, they were playing with the lead, but they were kind of playing with house money and, and they just couldn't string along really any hits at all especially off Framber Valdez, five innings, five innings, two hits given up. I mean, for a rookie coming in relief of Gringy in the, in the fifth inning. So he pitched, he pitched outstanding and the twins, you know, Sergio Romo, this is a guy who's won world series. He's closed out world series games to win world series in 2012 with the giants. 
you know, he didn't get it done yesterday. And the Astros, you know, a lot of the hitting woes kind of continued. First game off Kenta Maeda. But the one guy who's been solid throughout the entire season has been Michael Brantley. He's been constant. The only guy who hit over 300 this year for the Astros was Michael Brantley. And he came in with a really big clutch hit, proving his worth. So the Twins are in trouble. They got, they got Barrios going today. Uh, again, another case of very inconsistent. And you really don't know what you're going to get with him. But the Astros are throwing Jose Urquidy. And I think that's something to really be concerned about with the Astros going forward is they don't have that pitching depth anymore like they used to. And I think that's going to be tested tonight. So I think Twins are going to snap that streak tonight and get a win back. All right, that's fair. Yeah, I mean, especially without Justin Verlander for the Astros, I think that definitely is a huge – I mean, already to a pretty decimated starting pitching staff, that's, that's kind of a, an even bigger nail in the coffin there. Jason, are you, are you in agreement with Nick there, do you think? Would you bet on the, the Twins getting their, their, <laughs> their first playoff win in 17 games? I would, and um, I would also say that if they can win tonight, I would also bet on them game three because of how inconsistent Lance McCullough Jr. has been. Um, I think one of the most inconsistent uh, pitchers in baseball. It's, I mean, sometimes not even making it out of the first inning, sometimes going, you know, seven, eight shutty uh, with, you know, upwards of 12, 13 strikeouts. Um, I definitely think that's something to watch for tomorrow if they can squeak by this game. Uh, uh, right, that's going on right now that's uh, underway. Um, and I think that's definitely something to look at. For sure, for sure. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close out the segment with this. Do, do one last little piece here. Jason, I'm going to go to you first. If there's one series, we obviously talked about series, you know, you guys are paying attention to. If there's one series you had to bet on and, and maybe a series line, whether it was in yeah. two games or three games, is there one series you're super confident in that you would bet on? Yeah, there is, and it would, and it might be surprising, uh, but it's going to be the Cardinals, and here's why: um, they're they're underdogs. They're plus one fifty underdogs. That's uh, hundred to win one hundred fifteen. Um, and Clevy is Mike Clevenger um, is now the front line starter of the Padres. He's not on the roster; he's out with injury. And their second big guy, Danielson Lamette, is also left off the roster with injury. So that leaves them with today um, going with. Uh, well, tomorrow will be Zach Davies, um, to, um, and then Wednesday, or, or sorry, not Wednesday, game three will either be Garrett Richards, who's been very inconsistent, or it'll be uh, Moharon, who's been even more consistent. And then the Cardinals have all of the postseason experience in the world. The Padres have, have none, really. And then they have Kim today starting, who's got a, a below 1-5 ERA. They have Wayno, Adam Wainwright starting tomorrow who's got I mean he's been a postseason MVP before and then they'll have Jack Clarity the ace throwing game three so I really like the Cardinals yeah I mean especially when you break it down like that really anything can happen in a three-game series like this just because you get the pitch-up matching you want and you can really start you know taking advantage of a series like that and definitely like you brought up with the Padres not having Clevenger hurts a lot especially because that's who they acquired at the deadline as their big you know their big deal right there um and also with the Padres, they don't have that experience, like you said. And I think that is certainly could certainly factor in. Obviously, Fernando Tatis had a huge year this year, but there's not a lot of postseason experience there, none at all. So it's it's going to be really interesting to see what the Padres there. That might be, you know, when you bring up the the veteran leadership that the Cardinals have, plus you know the starting rotation that they have right now, it, it you know they can take out a, a, a favorite like the Padres in a three game series because of that lack of inexperience and of course some of those injuries. Nick, is there a series you're looking at where you would feel pretty confident uh, in betting and, and seeing end in either two or three? Uh, obviously, we have some that are already, you know, in game two that could end in game two, but is there anything you're looking at that, that you're pretty confident in? I think the Yankees are going to close it out tonight. Uh, the Yankees look like a team on a mission. They got all their guys back in the lineup, and you saw Glaber. He had a really good home run yesterday off Bieber. I think that's good for his confidence because, obviously, we, we know the struggles he had this year seeing the ball. Aaron Judge is back. He's mashing already. I think the Yankees are on a mission to go deep into these playoffs. And, you know, a lot of the question is about their starting pitching. Tonight they're going with Tanaka. I thought Tanaka pitched pretty well this year, I would say, uh, compared to his last couple of years. He was a bit more consistent this year. And, you know, they have a tough task against Carlos Carrasco, but they had a tougher task yesterday against Shane Bieber, and we saw what happened there. So I think Tanaka can give them at least five to six good innings tonight. And I think if they touch Carrasco early, I think the Yankees are going to walk away because the strength of the Yankees is the bullpen that they do possess. And I think once they get there, the Yankees will win game two and move on. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a 
pretty fair bet, I think. Um, I, I can't disagree with that. You know, the Yankees have obviously, you know, score again, scoring 12 runs. It shows the dominance you had against uh, arguably, I, I mean, it's not really even arguable. It's the Indians' best pitcher. Um, and he hasn't given up that many runs since like his sixth or seventh start of his career, which was, you know, three or four years ago now. So, um, you know, you break that confidence and it's, it's, it looks pretty good for the Yankees. Um, I'm going to go, I'm going to go with mine. I'm going to go with the, uh, the White Sox. Um, this White Sox team has been just amazing to watch this year. A lot of young guys, you know, obviously veterans like Jose Abreu has stepped up big. There's a question that he might end up being a MVP for the American League this year probably is a safe bet. Um, but I think, I think the White Sox are going to get it done. I think they're going to close it out in two. They're already up one, one in the series, I believe. So yeah, I think, I think this White Sox team right now, they're just, there's not, it's kind of like the Padres where there's not a ton of playoff experience there just because they've been so bad for so long. But I think just because they're so deadly with Moncada and Madrigal and obviously Luis Robert, I think they're just such a tough team to beat. They got the, you know, we obviously saw, you know, how good Lucas Giolito is. We see how good, you know, that pitching staff is for them. I think it's going to be really tough, especially in a three-game series like this, to get rid of the White Sox. So um, I'm, I'm going to edge the, the White Sox here. So with that being said, that'll do it for our baseball segment. Finally good to talk some MLB postseason here. Glad we got to talk to it. It's crazy. This season kind of flew by. Obviously, it's 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 half as, uh, half as long, probably even less half, less than half, but – you know, it, it is uh, it is fun to watch. So um, thank you, boys, for joining me for this segment. Next segment, we're going to talk NBA finals. We're talking about another final that uh, is occurring. So uh, stick around with us. We'll be right back with uh, some basketball coverage. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to HCF Bets. Your boy is back on this segment, ready to talk the NBA finals. Nick and Robert are my co-stars along with me. And guys, well, after all the craziness through the cancellation to the amazing experience that was the 2020 NBA playoffs, we get down to the two final teams in this on the Western Conference side. I hate to say it, and I know Robert is definitely smiling, but the Los Angeles Lakers have slayed the dragon that was the Denver Nuggets in a 4-1 to series. Lakers in five uh, took it again. Um, you know, um, it, it was hard for me to, to even come on today, but hey, to the victors go the spoils. So Robert, shout out to you. But in a silver lighting, the Miami Heat are also in the finals as well, taking down the Boston Celtics in a four games to two series. The Lakers are a minus 375 going into the series while the Heat are plus 280. So the Heat are a bit of an underdogs uh, coming in. But if you tell Jimmy Butler that, he thinks that there's a good chance to win. Nick, I want to start off with you. I mean, for Jimmy Butler, this is this is no cakewalk for sure in terms of facing, if not one of the greatest players of all time. But how are you seeing this series play out uh, between the Lakers and the Heat, knowing some of the contests that we got during the regular season? Well, first off, don't think I didn't miss you saying that calling the Nuggets a dragon and that was Slade. I didn't miss that one. <laughs> Let's get that out of the way first. Moving on to the teams that are in the finals. Uh, the Heat, as you brought up, Jimmy Butler. Jimmy Butler is a bad man. He is. And, you know, he lives for moments like these, and it's time to put up or shut up because in all, in all defense with Jimmy Butler, he's done it all throughout these playoffs. He has a good career history of, of showing up in the playoffs. But this is the big test right here. This is the Lakers. This is LeBron James. This is Anthony Davis. You know, let's see it. And this is the best team I think he's ever been a part of when you look at the depth and you look at the coaching that they have. And a guy that I think is going to play a really big factor in this series is Andre Iguodala. He is yes. another guy who shows up in the postseason. He shows up in the NBA Finals. A lot of experience there. I think he's going to give you a solid, you know, 13, 18 minutes a night because they have another similar player in Jay Crowder who I think is going to get more minutes than him. But he's going to be a very big X factor. And for the Lakers, we know what LeBron and AD are going to give you. The problem with the Lakers, I don't know who the third best player on the team is. You know, there's a very big drop off from there. And, you know, I think the heat to keep the Lakers from, from running the score up on them because LeBron and AD are facilitated so well between the two, they got to send the Lakers to the, to the free throw line. They're shooting 74% from the free throw line, which is bottom, bottom in the, uh, is one of the worst rates of any team in the playoffs. While the Heat, I believe, are second or third right now in free throw percentage in the bubble. So I think that's going to be a really big factor. And you got to keep Anthony Davis off the boards. Anthony Davis averaged only 6.2 rebounds in the last series, something the Nuggets were able to exploit. 
And I think the Heat can do the same because they have some absolute maulers down there like Bam Adebayo. So the Heat have a lot of advantages in this series. Uh, but, you know, it's LeBron James in, in, a, in, a, in a championship final. And he's not facing a super team like Golden State like he did all these years. So I think he's very motivated to get a championship for Los Angeles. No, absolutely. I mean, to think from last year, everybody thought that this was the beginning of the decline. I mean, I thought he was just going to collect all the movies, collect all the money, and really just sit down and enjoy for Hollywood. But year 17, LeBron says, I'm not done yet. I'm not ready to dethro get dethroned off my pedestal. And, um, you know, he's shown up um, in this. And then, of course, in the last game when the Lakers needed him the most, he got a triple-double. 38, I believe, 16 and 10. I mean, that was an incredible stat, stat line. And, you know, give credit to them. I mean, you know, as you mentioned, the third score is going to be a factor. It's a, either going to toss up at night between Rondo, whether it's going to be a toss up with Kuzma, if he can get going, Danny Green, or even Alex Caruso off the bench. But Robert, you're the les resident Laker head on, on this show. So let's get to you. I want to know your perspective. I mean, this is, this is an interesting series. Um, I mean, personally, on your side, what did the Lakers have to do um, to take down um, the Heat in terms of this? Because they played great defensively. It's going to be a matchup between Bam Adebayo, Anthony Davis, but Jimmy Butler's got LeBron. How, is, how do the Lakers got to be able to continue on this series and win the title? Yeah, I mean, just play the way you've been playing. I mean, you know, you guys brought up the point about, you know, who's the third man on the team. I, I would say throughout this whole playoffs – it doesn't matter who the third guy is. It's it's kind of just next guy up, it seems like, with the Lakers. Obviously, after Anthony Davis and LeBron, it's a little bit of a drop-off as far as consistent players, especially because Avery Bradley decided to sit out uh, the postseason. But, you know, it it varies on, se uh, on, on series. With the Rockets series, it was Rajon Rondo. In the Nuggets series, it was Dwight Howard. So it really doesn't matter who that third guy is. I think the Lakers have enough and some shock because people blasted their depth all season long. The Lakers have depth. Markeith Morris has the potential to go off and score. Dwight Howard has proven he's had a huge bounce back year. Um, you know, all these guys that are playing for the Lakers, with the exception of maybe, you know, Kyle Kuzma and Danny Green, who just aren't shooting well, but Danny Green's defense has been there. Um, you know, the rest of the team has stepped up pretty big. Again, you know, Markeith Morris, you've seen stuff out of him. You've seen stuff out of Rondo. You've seen stuff out of Howard. Um, so it's just for the Lakers, they have to just keep playing the game they're playing. It's working. They're matching styles and it's working. They matched the rocket small ball. They sat McGee and Dwight Howard for that entire series or for the majority of that series. And they beat them in five. They played the nuggets. They matched the nuggets, nugget style to beat them in five. So this Lakers team, I think is a lot deeper than a lot of people give them credit for. Um, yeah, you don't have the big flashy names, you know, especially I think the heat have more quality depth than Iguodala and, and Crowder and stuff like that. And obviously Tyler Hero's going off and Duncan Robinson. But, you know, with, with regards to the Lakers, the Lakers can just match styles. And I think the Lakers are going to be a really tough matchup for the Heat. I would argue that the Lakers are their toughest matchup of the season um, simply because, you know, the Milwaukee Bucks were not at all anywhere, anywhere close to how they played in the regular season. And obviously – Giannis was was injured for the last two or three games of that series so I, I think this is going to be a tough matchup for the Heat I'm definitely concerned with the Heat but I think I would be a little bit more confident playing the Heat than I was against the Nuggets I think the Nuggets are more of a tough matchup for the Lakers so the Lakers should win this series but it's going to be tough and you kind of have to just make sure you get a hold of Jimmy Butler because he's on a prove it prove it year well, it's not even Jimmy Butler. I mean, I look at this Miami Heat team, and, and it's not just their defense that has been stifling. I mean, you got to look at Duncan Robinson. You got to look at Tyler Harrow. You got to look at Kendrick Nunn. I think it's a matter of shutting down the quality guys around the perimeter and paint because Miami has just been, been killing it around. When they get hot on the corners or within the uh, top of the paint, top of the key, like they are, if not one of the uh, most efficient as well as the highest scoring offenses. So, Robert, I mean, for the Lakers, you, you mentioned that even though they don't have the stars, they do have the depth enough and they can match up against anybody. But personally, who's one player on the Miami Heat that you feel could be an X factor in terms of this series? I mean, we already know, of course, the big names, Jimmy Butler. I mean, Nick mentioned Andre Iguodala. This is his sixth 
NBA Finals appearance. He's made six NBA Finals dating back from his time for the Warriors. Could he be an X factor with his championship experience? Jay Crowder, who are you seeing maybe potentially giving fits for, for the Lake Show? Yeah, I, I think if anything, it's Andre Iguodala. You know, even though Iggy's up there in age now, I mean, like you said, it's that veteran leadership. It's that championship experience. He's been there enough times to where he knows how to win in the NBA Finals. And so he knows how he can get the team motivated. He knows how he can get the team, you know, in a zone to where they can play their style and they can match up against the Lakers. So, yes, he's not a central piece anymore, but because he's a good depth option and because he has so much championship experience, I think he can bring that in. And that gives a pretty inexperienced Miami Heat team. You know, when you look at Hero and Robinson, their first finals, it's Hero's first year. You know, Jimmy Butler uh, hasn't been in the – you know, in, in the finals before. So it's, it's really that experience, same with Bam. So, so that experience that Iguodala brings is invaluable because that's something you can't teach. You can't tell them they can get better at that. They're not going to have that veteran experience until they go through an NBA finals like this. So having Iguodala in the locker room is pretty much as valuable as it can get as having him on the court because you're looking for that veteran experience, that leadership, that advice, and how to take down another team in the finals they've made it this far as underdogs they can do it again I'm not going to deny they've been I and I listen I, I want to toot my own horn here because I said don't doubt the Miami Heat the Miami Heat are really good um so I, I think they can continue to prove it but you know yeah those veteran guys need to step up and they need to you know not maybe take control but they need to get get their guys that confidence that they can take down this Lakers team Absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, Iguodala's experience in uh, like just to have that locker room presence. I mean, you already have the captain of the ship being Jimmy Butler. He already knows how to get his guys going. But, you know, J this has been the first time Jimmy Butler has gotten as far as he can with any other team. I mean, I mean, the Bulls, the Timberwolves, the 76ers, they haven't come close to the teams that he's been a part of. And of course, when you have a great coach like Eric Spolstra, I mean, you know, what a year this Miami Heat team had to finish from 10th in the East last year to now get back there. But Nick, I want to ask this question. I mean, the last time the Lakers played the Heat, it was December, December 13th. I went to that game. It was a couple days after my birthday. So it was a late birthday treat for me. And it was a dogfight. The Heat could have almost won the game and they could have tied it, sent it to overtime, but it was denied on the last second uh, buzzer that sailed wide to the left of the side of the rim. So, I mean, Despite the months in the difference in between the last two times that these two teams have faced, do you think Miami is still prepared? Or who do you see maybe on the Lakers, Nick, that could try to maybe become that X factor in terms of this? Are we going to see more closer matchups? Or do you think that there are going to be some games where they're just going to trade back and forth and run away, even though the Lakers swept them during the season series? I don't think Miami's built to like blow out teams. Miami's built to keep it close, play great defense and shut down the best player on the other team. They're not going to do that in this series. I don't think because it's, I just don't think you can shut down LeBron James. And when the other, the next best player is Anthony Davis, it's one of the, it's one of the handful of guys, no matter what you do, you can't really neutralize them, you know? So, and kind of like the meeting you were saying, I don't put much stock into it because it's been, it's been a long time, like you said, in between that. And a lot of the big X factor for the Heat is a lot of their young guys, Tyler Harrow, Duncan Robinson, they're much, they're much more developed. They're basically playing in their second year, if we're, if we're calling it what it is right now. They've had a lot of time where they, in the offseason where they got better. I call it the offseason, the COVID break, whatever you want to call it. So that's a big difference, I think, as well. And I'll eat my words. Uh, coming into the playoffs, I had the Heat losing in the first round. I said that the NBA championship is not won with young players and – here it is. Tyler Harrow wants to put up 37 points, one game in a playoff series. Duncan Robinson wants to shoot the lights out. Kendrick Nunn, yada, yada, yada. Um, so, but, but again, the guy we haven't brought up yet is Goran Dragic. He is the leading scorer the right for Miami, the Grizzles veteran. He's also a big, important piece to this team. So that's going to be very important. But you asked for one player on the Lakers who I think has got to step up. It's the obvious choice. It's Kyle Kuzma. There's just no other way to look around it. It's just no other way. He's, he looks like he's getting worse. I, I don't see anything game to game that gives me any confidence that Kyle Kuzma just somehow is just going to find his shot again or find his confidence. Just or his defense. Good. Yeah, you, Robert, you, <laughs> watch all, you watch all the Laker games very close. I want him gone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, the, the trade value is long gone, Robert. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
but yeah, he he's something's got to change there. But but as Robert said though, they haven't it hasn't stopped them yet because it's LeBron and AD, and LeBron just can't be stopped sometimes, and you just have to say it is what it is. So uh, in that sense, the Lakers probably need somebody to step up, but I still think they can get by Miami with with the way things have been going. No, absolutely. I think you know th- this is going to be a, f- a fun series. I mean. If we thought last year between the Raptors and Warriors was as good of a finals, I think we're really buckled up for this. But, Robert, I mean, other than the grimace face with Kyle Kuzma and stuff, I want to just ask, though, I mean, there's a lot of X factors that we're talking about, not only on the court, but also off the court, because LeBron James is going to face the team that he left six years ago after losing the finals. So there is a little bit of a... I guess you could say seething, uh, at least from my side of Fort Lauderdale, from the Miami Heat fan base, because LeBron James is going to face his former coach, as well as his former boss, Pat Riley. And for Pat Riley, he's now made the finals in over five decades, whether he was a player for the Lakers, a coach for the Lakers, coach for the Knicks, Heat coach and team president, and now team president. Is that a storyline, personally, that you feel is going to be something to watch out for? in terms of Pat Riley, LeBron James, or what other storyline do you think could intertwine in this series? Yeah, I mean, definitely the, the biggest storyline, I think, is like you said, it's Pat Riley, it's the Lakers, it's LeBron. It's, it's LeBron facing off against his former team that he took to two championships. Um, excuse me, the three championships, right? Well, he won two, but they went to four straight finals. That, yeah, 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 yeah. Two, yeah, that's what I was right. Um, but yeah, no, listen, it's, it's the team he took, you know, obviously one of the one original, if you want to call them, I don't know if it's so much original, but one of the original super teams in the NBA, him, Bosch and Wade, and obviously, you know, Ray Allen at one point too. But, uh, you know, this, this Heat team obviously is much different from that team. There's no Dwayne Wade, there's no Bosch, you know, there's no LeBron. So LeBron having to play against that former team, maybe it's not the same, but it is his former coach, Eric Spolstra. You know, it is his former uh president, if you want to call him that, uh, Pat Riley. The godfather, as we the call godfather, him. Himself. The godfather of heat culture. Um, <laughs> and, you know, with regards to the Lakers, it's, you know, Pat Riley was the coach of the Showtime Lakers, you know, Magic and Kareem. There's a lot of love for Pat Riley because Pat Riley, aside from Phil Jackson, is arguably the greatest Lakers coach of all time. So there's a lot of history between those two teams. So I think, yeah, as far as storylines, for me, personally, as a Lakers fan, the storyline I'm watching is, you know, can they kind of show up Pat Riley and can LeBron James, you know, show up his, his former team that kind of said there was rumors that they kind of said, Pat Riley kind of said, you know, you're not going to win anything away from the Heat. This is, your, this is where you have it best. You're never going to win another championship. Obviously went to Cleveland and won a championship. Now he has a chance to do it with another team. So th- there's a ton of storylines in this and it's going to be fun to watch. Nick, what's your favorite storyline going into the finals? I think it's Eric Spolstra. Uh, everybody is starting to see how great of a coach he is and how would it be for Eric Spolstra to have LeBron James leave your team in 2014 and six years later you're in the finals facing that man who left you out to dry who left you to rebuild and the Miami Heat did an exceptional job of drafting and acquiring the right talent and the right pieces to go together into his scheme and his system it's been a tremendous job. I mean, he, he'll be laughing at the bank if he, if he can say, he can put on his resume, I beat LeBron James. I beat him. He left me, and I came back, and I beat him. And so I'm looking for that, and I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, but if it does happen, I, I think the legacy of Eric Spolstra is cemented forever, and he's a Hall of Fame coach. One of my favorite storylines going into the finals outside of Eric Spolstra is really an unsung hero of this Miami Heat group. And I know, Robert, you mentioned – uh, Andre Iguodala is being a veteran leader on that club. But I think we're forgetting, guys, about one more player, and that's Alon- not Alonzo, excuse me, Udonis Haslam. I mean, you know, to think for the fact that throughout the Heat's existence and through the six now title games that they've been in, Udonis Haslam has been a part of all of them. So, you know, even though UD40 hasn't gotten much time to spin, obviously year 17, you know, he ain't the fresh Udonis Haslam. He was back with the core rows. But I will say that you know, for him to be a part of it, to be a part of that sort of, I guess, line of championships, being a part of that, I think that could be a big factor in. You never, Udonis Haslam has been productive as well in the finals in his career. So, you know, for him to maybe get that opportunity to spin, who knows if that could be something uh, for this young core group to be inspired of. So Robert, even though, yes, Andre Iguodala has the championship pedigree, 
I look to the guy who's been a part of all the finals from the Shaq and Alonzo days, from the big three days. So I think maybe that locker room experience could help with it. I mean, this is going to be, like I said, a fun series. And I'm looking forward to this competitive bash. But we have to get to the two important lines in terms of betting. And, Nick, I'm going to start with you. For your bet, I want one. Who do you think could be the finals MVP? Who are you putting your money on to be, when it's all said and done, the NBA finals MVP outside of the series? And who do you have? You said you have, I'm assuming, the Lakers. How many games are we going to have that? I'm going to go with the Lakers in six. I think I think they can get it done in six. I think Miami's going to steal two, keep it close. And if the Lakers are winning in six, if the Lakers are winning this whole thing, the MVP is LeBron James. I think he got robbed of being league MVP in the regular season. And I think, you know, mm-hmm. he just looks like he's locked in this year. Uh, more so than I've ever seen him. And if they're going to win, he's probably going to have like a triple-double in every game or he's going to be approaching it. So LeBron James, I think, is a slam-dunk MVP choice that the Lakers get it done. Yeah, the Lakers have to get it done for numerous occasions, obviously for Colby as well as, you know, for everything that this team was expected to do. I mean, Robert, you saw this team going to the finals. Uh, Is this again going to be Lakers in five or do you think this one is going to be one for the books in terms of a true, true test? Um, you know, just because it's the final, I'm going to say Lakers in six, like Nick said. I, I said Lakers in six last series, too, and it ended in five. So I like to take, uh, I like to go a little bit longer just uh, just in case they do win in four or five. I doubt they win in four, but, um, you know, I, I think Lakers in six. Uh, as far as finals MVP, I'm going to go with this man right here. I'm going to take a page out of your book, Okalo. I'm, I'm putting on the jersey. It's, uh, I think it's going to be Anthony Davis. Anthony Davis has been phenomenal this entire series for the Lakers, um, you know, obviously against the Nuggets, it was game two, he hits that game winning shot, completely changed the momentum of that yeah. series. Um, one of, just one of the great moments you'll yeah. see in the playoffs. Um, so I, I think- That's a as, nightmare as much, for me. <laughs> I love as it. much of a, as a um, maybe sure thing as, as LeBron is, we know how LeBron steps up. I think Anthony Davis has really been the MVP of the entire playoffs, really, probably the most consistent player for the Lakers because LeBron has had off games. So I would say as far as this series goes, it's probably going to be LeBron, but feelings wise, I would go and who I would bet on is, is Anthony Davis. All right. So it seems like one LeBron, one AD, but I hate to be the lone wolf of this um, guys, but you know, who wouldn't I be? Who wouldn't I be if I didn't choose the underdog? If I did not go from South Florida with love, Miami Heat in seven games. And why? Because I got Troy and Armand telling me it's going to be like a pattern. The Heat won the Pacer series in four. They beat the Bucks in five in six games with the Celtics. Why not finish it in seventh heaven? I'm going to go Miami Heat in seven. And I'm going to say the playoff MVP, I'm going to go for a long shot here, and it's going to be Tyler Hero. I mean, superhero to, to win it as a rookie. I know, Nick, I know it sounds outrageous, but hear me out. I mean, from everybody who doubted him, from even the Miami Heat fans who that draft night were saying, who Who did we get with the 13th pick? Tyler Hero has been proving doubters all season wrong. Um, It was a bit of a crime shame a little bit that he wasn't uh, mentioned much in terms of rookie of the year um, when it came down to the final awards. I felt like when they put Zion in, I was like, man, you could have put Tyler Hero in. I mean, he was was from start to finish outside of John Moran, another outstanding rookie outside of Kendrick Nunn. Um, he's averaged 20 uh, points per game throughout the series. And I, like, I'm going to be interested to see who guards him. I mean, you know, how are you going to stop Tyler Hero on the outside when he lays up, when he gets that motion back and lay it back? I think we're going to see NBA Finals history um, in terms of a rookie winning this award. So this is going to be a fun, exciting series. So to wrap up this segment, guys, I want you to give me one prediction for um, a game, whether whether it's a true bet in terms of maybe a game you um, – in terms of maybe a moment that's going to happen in the game, or as well as, like, say, for example, I will bet that Jimmy Butler hits the game winner in game two to to take the series lead uh, for, for this. So, Robert, I want to start with you. What's one big bet are you betting on in terms of this finals for anything that could happen, Lakers or Heat side? Oh, man. Um... I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with the the Lakers are going to 
blow out the heat in game one. That's my big bet. I think they're gonna they're gonna come in. I think they're gonna come in strong. The Lakers have a tendency to blow teams out. Um, you know, they they do do it. They, that's their style. They kind of don't keep things very close defensively or offensively. So I'm gonna go with game one. They won game one of last series. I think they're going to win game one of this series again. I think it's going to be a blowout. I think the Lakers are just going to come in with a full head of steam. And I think they're really going to take this young Heat team by surprise. I think, I think that's, and they're going to get the series started off on the right foot. That's my bet. Nick, what about you? What's going to be one big bet that you're going to secure on for the finals? I'm going to go a little bit out of the box here, but it's going to contradict your point about Tyler Harrow. So I'll, I'll be happy to make this bet. I said this series is going six games, and in those six games, Tyler Harrow will score under 10 points and be a non-factor in three of them. I am predicting three of the six games, Tyler Harrow is under 10 points, because guess what? After he scored 37 points, everybody crowned him. Tyler Harrow this, Tyler Harrow that. What did he do the next game? Super Harrow. What did he do the next game, Okello? Uh... Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 you can leave it at that. You can leave it. Uh, at but, that. But, 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 but hey, but hey, I'm just saying this. Tyler Hero again has proven doubters wrong. If you want to join Paul Pierce in the L Club, you're more than welcome to Nick. Um, I'll, I'm sure he'll be sitting right at the table I, with you and I may be on an island. I may be on an island, but I love Paul Pierce's takes. And we oh can, my God! We can get to that. We can get to that another time, but. But I'll sit on that. I'll sit on that. We'll, save that, for, we'll save that for another day. It, it's like I said, it's going to be a fun, interesting series. And we'll see what the results come without on the series as it goes on with game one. So coming up next to wrap up HTF bets, we're going to talk a little fantasy football. I'm going to eat another L this week, but we'll discuss some fantasy things as we continue on. Hopefully the heat can resurrect me from the grave. Stay tuned. HTF bets. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the last segment of HTF Bets. We're glad you're still here with us. What do you know it? I can't believe it. We are approaching week four of the NFL season just flying by. And with that, that means we have week four of fantasy football to talk about. But before we get there, we're going to quickly recap last week, week three of fantasy football, particularly in our league, where we saw the last place teams, Robert and Okello, faced off in a matchup. Robert lost Christian McCaffrey for four to six weeks. And he responded by acquiring James Conner midweek in a very controversial trade. Okello seems to think there was some colluding going on in this league. Yeah, uh, I feel like y'all are, y'all are at me to, to, to lose this because y'all don't like me that much. Yeah, he, he <laughs> thinks there was some colluding going on. I'm not going to say whether there was or not, so we're going to move on from that. But Robert, with that big acquisition, he sunk Okello to 0-3. Robert, I what did by 10, mind you. That was the closest win I've had all season. Well, and it's only, it's only close in horseshoes. So uh, we're going to keep it to Robert. I'll see you in week 12. I'll see you in week 12. And I'll see you this week. So, and we'll get to that in a second. But Robert, you put down Okello. What's going right for your team and your output for as you take on John Whitley? Yeah, I mean, uh, the acquisition definitely helped. Losing Christian McCaffrey, I was just – at a complete loss because I don't know where to go to get a, a running back. There's no available running backs. I could have actually went with um, Rex Burkhead. He had three touchdowns this past weekend. That would have been nice. But, um, you know, as far as running backs, I had to make a move. So I uh, met together with Sean and uh, I said, Sean, I will give you DeAndre Hopkins. And he gave me uh, Amari Cooper and um, James Conner. So Amari Cooper did fairly well, had a little, had a little under 15, I think. Uh, and James Conner had about like 24 points. So that definitely helped out uh, immediately, especially because Lamar Jackson did not have a great game, um, especially compared to Aaron Rodgers, who's sitting on my bench. Um, really wish I would have started Rodgers, but I thought Lamar Jackson would have had a much better game. Um, so that's a decision I have to make coming into this week against John Whitley is whether or not to start Aaron Rodgers or uh, Lamar Jackson. <clears throat> And then tight end two, uh, Travis Kelsey only got me like 14 points again, like 14, 15 points. So, um, 
you know, that's another question I have to make going into this week is whether or not I want to start Tyler Higby, who's going to be playing the Giants, or Travis Kelsey and the Chiefs. Um, so it's it's definitely some some questions for my team. I'm glad I won. I'm not 0-3. Um, you know, even though Okalo is not the only 0-3 team, so that's that's good for him. He's not he's not all by his lonesome at the bottom. Um, but no, definitely I needed to avoid going 0-3, and, and I did. And the acquisition helped. It, it saved my uh, saved my week. So did Daryl Henderson. He had all, uh, just under 20 points, so it went well this week. Yeah, Robert buttoning up some loose ends on his team. Okello, as we just noted, you took the L again. Uh, but you showed some signs of life. I will give you that. But it doesn't get any easier because you were taking on my team, which is two and one. You will take an L this week. I big, guarantee. A big victory for myself over John Whitley. Uh, but with that being said, Okello, what are the keys for you this week? Well, the key for me, one, is uh, the quarterback position. I mean, I had on my mind um, this week either Matt Ryan or I just acquired now. I was just doing a little bit of, of roster flip turnover, and I'm thinking about starting Jared Goff this week against a pitiful New York Giants defense. So I believe um, in that as well as I'm going to get Devin Singletary, his first start um, on my team this year. I mean, he's playing a very poor 30-second dead last Raiders run defense, and um, you know, I, I finally going to get Tyler Boyd out with Keenan Allen. I'm keeping um, James Robinson because he did wonders for me. Um, you know, I'm disappointed in tight end a little bit because uh, this, with the Steelers Titans game getting canceled, um, you know, that put a damper on my roster because I had Johnny Smith, who's been outstanding for the start of the season. So I fortunately maybe have to go back to Hayden Hurst. I'm going to make a decision. Um, I'm going to also flip my defense. The Patriots defense did help, but when you're playing Patrick Mahomes and you got to go to Arrowhead Stadium, that's not a, a good sign either. So um, I believe this week that it's going to be on the right track for me. I think, you know, Ezekiel Elliott just has to make sure he maintains his consistency. And, you know, I, I believe, I mean, uh, to, to know that I was right there that close, I mean, with, with Robert, one of the closest games that I've had so far this fantasy season. And I had the lead, but, you know, with Travis Kelsey and Lamar Jackson, it kind of KO'd me. So um, I just got to pray um, on consistency and as well as the fact for my quarterback play because Gardner Minshew only gave me nine points and he, he didn't have it. So um, this week I may be looking uh, to, to get a trade, to try to jumpstart my team and to get out of the losing column, take you down and end this uh, pitiful thing I've, what I've been in in terms of losing fantasy games, not in some of my other leagues, but this one, and as well as uh, the Nuggets being eliminated from the playoffs and, uh, and, and at least on your lighter and the Lightning winning the Stanley Cup so, and you winning. So it's like a double W, triple, if you count the Rays uh, doing well in the playoffs and the Buccaneers now to a one. So uh, I'm just hoping. I'm just hoping. Win, and then hopefully if the Steelers and Titans play, that the Steelers are going to go for it now. Yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens with your team, Okello. Uh, I am expecting you to give me the best you have this week. And I don't have Chris Godwin this week, so a little bit hit there. But the beauty of that is Allen Robinson checks back in. He got me 26 points on my bench. It's Nick Foles season. No more Mitchell Trubisky. Very excited about that. But we're going to move on now. And, you know, every we do this every single week. One start, one sit. I'm going to start with you, Robert. Give me your one best start and your one best sit for this week that fantasy football players should know. Um, I'm going to go Will Fuller. Um, Texans are playing the Browns this week. Um, you mean the Vikings? As far as, as, oh, they're playing the Vikings. Yeah, they are playing the Vikings this week. I don't know why I said the Browns. Yeah, they're playing the Vikings. Vikings, have, Vikings defense has not been good at all this season. Um, I don't know what's up with the Vikings defense. I guess they lost a lot of pieces that, you know, losing Xavier Rose, losing Everson Griffin looks like it's having a huge impact on that defense. Um, they have not been good. So, uh, for the Texans, the Texans haven't been great either, but I think Will Fuller, this is a game where he can really uh, rack up some yardage, especially as a, maybe as more of a waiver wire pick or a guy that maybe is usually starting on your bench. I think this is a good week for him to start just because the Vikings defense is so questionable um, at this point. Um, I don't really foresee it getting better for the Vikings this week. Um, so I, I think Will Fuller is a, a nice little safe bet, you know, maybe somebody that, that is pretty easy to acquire in your league. Um, either because he's on the waiver wire or because he's on a lot of team benches just because he hasn't had, you know, a huge season yet and, and neither have the Texans. So um, I think this is a nice matchup for the Texans. I think this is a chance for Wolf Fuller to, to get some good fantasy points this week. Yeah, who would your one sit be then? Um, one sit? 
I think I got to go Carson Wentz. I, I, I'm pretty sure I said Carson Wentz last week. I think I got to go Carson Wentz again this week. I mean, he's just been so, so bad this year. Just interception after interception. Does not look comfortable. You can't blame it all on him. Um, you know, the, the Eagles offensive line is just – just really, really shaky at best. It's it's bottom bottom league at worst, and I think it's not going to get any better. It's going to be a theme for uh, the Eagles all season. Zach Ertz isn't having a great season. Really, none of um, you know the Eagles are having a great season so far. So I think for the Eagles and for Carson Wentz, um, I know I'm sure there's plenty of leagues where Carson Wentz is QB one or was QB one because you took him later in the draft. Um, but I think at this point, it's it's a pretty safe bet that Carson Wentz should probably be starting on your bench, if not drop him altogether. He just he just doesn't have it right now this year, and I don't see it really getting any better right now. The offensive line's not going to get better, so neither is Carson Wentz. Yeah, mechanically, he just looks so off. Confidence looks shot, and they're facing the 49ers, who are hobbled. But you saw what they've done to Daniel Jones and Sam Darnold in back back weeks, and I can't believe I'm saying it, but Carson Wentz is a lot closer to them right now than he is to the Dak Prescott comparison that they seem to be married to over the years. Even Jared Goff. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're just keep going back and forth with those 2016 quarterbacks. Uh, no different again this year. I'll tell you what I'm starting. James Robinson. I, I'm sold. I'm sold. 30 points in fantasy last week, and he's facing the Bengals defense. 144 rushing yards given up week one against Joshua Kelly and Austin Eckler. 210 the next week against Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt. And then 95 given up yesterday – or last week, rather – to Miles Sanders. So great running backs come in for these teams and they have just gashed this defense open. Geno Atkins is not what he once was anymore on that, on that line. And the same, and DJ reader has not really made a big difference in the run defense for the Bengals so far this year. So I think James Robinson, that's, that's really the Swiss army knife in that Jack, Jacksonville offense. And I think he's going to have a really good game and solidify himself as a running back too, moving forward for the rest of the year. I'm going to switch it to you now. Okello, give me your one best start and your one best sit for week four of fantasy football. So my best start in the week, I'm going to start off by saying it all depends on a key injury. And if he doesn't play, it's going to be risky, but I still like how he's developed in. And it's Alan Lazard. He's been picked up high in fantasy over the past, over the past week. Um, you know, he went bananas, 26.4 fantasy points against the New Orleans Saints. He's facing, he's facing a Falcons defense that continues to just choke in terms of past secondary, A.J. Terrell being out. Um, they just have no defense. And I think that this is a prime game that you take advantage of Alan Lazard. I think he's a fantasy player on the rise in this Packers offense. He's starting to show, like, okay, I can be game this week um, in terms of, you know, giving out a pretty damn good show. So I look for, for Alan Lazard to be somebody that is going to start and is going to incline. I think if he gets another 20-plus points this week, it'll be no surprise to me. If you need a wide receiver, I think Alan Lazard is a wide receiver two and a low-end flex. And it pains me to say it, but I'm going to say for my sit of the week, it's going to be, and I because you all know how much I love him, but it's got to be Kirk Cousins. I mean, he just has not looked good at the season. He's shown some life you. at times, I but... You. I, I don't know what's wrong with the Vikings. And, you know, despite he had three touchdowns last week, unfortunately the Vikings took an L to end the week. Um, you know, the Texans have allowed the fourth most um, fantasy points in terms of running backs. And as well with their quarterbacks, it's been hit or high in terms of the mid-average reigns. But at this point right now, I can't trust the captain to lead my, sh my ship in terms of fantasy. So um, if you have Kirk Cousins this week, just don't play him. I mean – this Texas defense isn't really that any good, but until I see some more consistency out of Kirk Cousins, he's a guy that I can't even trust as my low-end QB1. He's going to be on the bench for me, and uh, I just wouldn't play him until, some, until the Vikings get started. I'll do you one better. If you have Kirk Cousins, just go ahead and hit the drop button. Uh, hit the drop button and move on. Uh, as, I told, as I've said to Okello many times on this show, Kirk Cousins is not it. Uh, he will not be leading the Vikings to a Super Bowl, Okello. I hate that. I know that breaks your heart. It breaks mine, too, because I'm a big Dalvin Cook fan, and it just is not looking good for that. I mean, he, I mean, him and Justin Jefferson, like, I mean, Justin Jefferson as well, like, like he showed up last week. He showed a, a bit of life in terms of them losing Stephon Diggs. Like, 
I don't know what Mike Zimmer has to do in order to get the Vikings straightened out, but they got to find it out this week because they're traveling to Houston. And, you know, th- these are two 0 3 teams. One of these teams is going to be 0 4. Um, you know, the Texans have proven in the past that they can come back from 0-3 and, and still win the AFC South, but uh, it's, it's not a cakewalk. It's not a cakewalk. So the Vikings need to do something, but I have to say this because I believe that they were going to win the NFC North in the beginning of the year. I don't think it's happening with the way Aaron Rodgers is playing. Yeah, this is a very winnable game for Minnesota, and we'll see if they can get the job done against the Houston Texans. But with that being said, that'll do it for this week's edition of HTF Bets. Make sure to tune in tomorrow for Sean Green's Almost Game Day, and we will see you next week. Thank you for joining us. That's what I'm talking about. Wait. Okay, now, from the beginning. <laughs>